Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this morning's session, which is day four of our Gains for Green webinar series. My name is Lilith Ives, and I'm the Marketing Development Agronomist covering Birchills, Canwood, and Nicklin Side in Geographies. The topic of today's session is oat and barley stra strategies, and we will be, and this will be presented jointly by myself and Gavin Andrews, one of our grain marketing advisors. While these gains for grains webinars do not serve as a full substitute for the annual crop production show, I hope that our team is or was able to provide you with some wholesome information and that this information will be very useful in stimulating discussions as we move forward into CPP season and then into the cropping season. Before I begin, just like to go over some quick housekeeping rules. This is not an automatic mute and entry meeting as such. Upon entering the, mute, the meeting room, please ensure that your microphones are on mute. Today's presentation is being recorded and we are an open form meeting. So if at any point during this presentation you have a question or a concern, you may raise your hand, which is the palm located on the top right hand section of your screen. You may also use the chat box or you may unmute your microphone and speak. So I'll jump right into it. Janina, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. I'm going to take a guess and say most, if not everyone here, is growing oat and barley. So what I'm going to basically do over the next 20 minutes or so is to broadly discuss some agronomic issues that affect oat and barley production. If you were here for a meeting on Wednesday, you will realize that the information is somewhat similar. And this is just because the agronomic management practices are going to be similar for small green crops. So there are lots of things that I could list about why we grow oats and or barley. I could list them off one by one and give lots of reasons for selecting my choices or making the claims I make. But I wanted to do something different. So I asked a few farmers to explain their reasons. And here goes. Next slide, please. So we have successfully grown oats for quite a few years. And by success, I mean obtaining yields of 110 bushels per acre or more and maintaining quality. When prices are around $3 per bushel or higher, it's a good return, especially since cost-wise they're a bit cheaper to grow than wheat and barley. They're cheaper to grow as we don't use grass chemicals, flag leaf fungicide is cheaper than dealing with fusarium, and we put a bit less fertilizer than we do on wheat and barley. Next one, please. Oats are nice to grow as they're an early maturing crop, so if seeding early in May can easily be harvested in August, or if seeded in June, there should be enough time for it to mature before our first fall frost. There aren't many insects that cause issues in oats, and in several new varieties, they have good disease resistance building. Although quite often, we will see a response to, 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 from fungicide, either in yield or quality or both. Our conditions are good for wheat and barley, but barley matures sooner and we can get the crop off before the risk of frost. The barley outperforms wheat economically for us. Our wheat yields have improved to 70 bushel, but 100 bushel barley is more consistent for us at lower cost per acre. Our local soil condition seems to prefer barley. We have good relationship with the molsters and they know that we provide consistent product and our relationship with them helps us in marketing. No, no, the next slide. You were right. Yeah. So what factors influence oat and barley profitability? This simple schematic here gives us an understanding of what's going on and 
the factors that will ultimately be influencing oat and barley. I mean, I'm sure everyone here would love if they had some amount of control over climate or over the weather. But because we don't, we have to strive to manage those factors that are considered to be in the realm of the control level. And these would be agronomic factors and markets, right? I mean, we probably have more advanced, more opportunities to control or agronomic factors than we do marketing. And we have varying degrees of, 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 of control over agronomic factors. And since this directly impact how, how the crop is gonna be grown, this is also gonna directly impact what it is that we get at the end of the day. So this is, this is the factor that I'm gonna be speaking on. So for the next few minutes, I'll just be talking about what agronomic factors can be or, or will be influencing our ultimate oat and barley profitability. Next slide, please. So if I was supposed to do a random poll and ask, what are your yields and test weights? Or what were your yields and test weights were like for last year or the last five years? I would get a range of numbers, anywhere from probably 110 to 200 bushel for oats from malt barley probably anywhere from 70 to 100 bushels per acre. Because this spread is pretty significant, it provides both the agronomists and the farmers with an opportunity to see how we can narrow this spread and move growers who are at the lower end of the scale towards getting higher yields on the higher end of the scale. And one of the one of the things that will or, or that will be very helpful is going to be variety selection right so we're going to talk about variety selection for a little bit and when we think about variety selection there are quite a number of questions that are going to be top of mind some things that are going to be top of mind for me are going to be disease resistance package since diseases can dramatically impact or affect our production and our ultimate return and investment, this is going to be a very key thing for us to be looking at. Am I going to be choosing an oat variety that has better resistance to rust as opposed to one that does not have very good resistance? Or am I going to be choosing a barley variety that's moderately resistant to say fusarium as opposed to one that doesn't? Another thing that's also of importance is going to be lodging resistance and height, right? Depending on where you are, the time, I mean, the, en the environmental condition in any given year, most farmers are going to have some issues with, with lodging, right? And different varieties behave differently, either depending on the fertility package that was done or depending on the weather condition, right? So we know that some crops are more pr prone to lodging. So am I going to select a variety that has less possibility or, or or less likelihood to lodge as opposed to one that doesn't. Markets are also going to be a very important one. So am I growing my barley for the feed market or am I trying to get malt? The same can be said for oats. Am I trying to get million oats or do I want to get feed, feed oat? So, I mean, th there are so many factors that can go into selecting a variety, and these are going to vary from farm to farm or from grow to grow. Also, sometimes it will vary from year to year. Another important thing is seeding rate. Seeding rate is impacted by the thousand kernel weight or TKW as we call them, and this is an important factor that we use to determine our seeding rate. Knowing the thousand kernel weight of a seed lot challenges us to think more about getting an optimum target plant population. The ideal plant population sometimes is going to vary depending on crop variety as well as soil type, but on average, depending on where you are in Saskatchewan, the ideal density for barley is going to be 20 to 25 plants per square foot, and for oats is going to be 30, 20 to 30 plants per square foot. The lower number is normally going to be people like in the south that has drier conditions and light, lighter soil conditions. So that 
means that um, we need to be making sure that we know that TKW, we know that, I mean, target seed plan population that we're aiming to get. So at the end of the day, we're not overseeding and we're not underseeding. So, I mean, yes, it's good that guys still use bushels per acre to determine their seed rate, but what you'll find that happen is sometimes this will lead to tin plants stand on even maturity, yield reduction, increased lodging. So it's just, it, 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 it makes more sense financially at the end of the day for girls to be thinking more of doing their seeding rate based on 1,000 kernel weights since they can calibrate their drills accordingly. And it's, 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 it's been scientifically proven that this is the better approach to use as opposed to continuing with the bushel weight, the bushel per acre. Planting date is also another important factor. Um, plant oats as early as possible, right? So oats are going to germinate or they'll start germinating from five degrees. But if it, it still needs a little bit of sunlight, sunlight and it likes to have some warm temperatures. So if you plant oats too late, you can get caught on the other end in that you get caught with hot weather and this will shut down the plant and you start getting low yields or you get high temperature spikes and this affects pollination and can also lower your yields. Similar thing can be said for barley and because barley tends to mature earlier than wheat and canola in Saskatchewan, most farmers will be tempted to seed in it later or they'll probably seed some early and then go back and seed some on the back end of seeding. But research out of Alberta has suggested that seeding malt barley early reduces um, results in better grain quality than later seeded barley. So early seeded oat and barley will tend to mature before soil moisture is depleted, making the crops better able to capitalize on longer spring days and the slight the cooler temperatures before the hottest parts of the summer. And in malt barley, um, seeding early will also help to avoid cool wet fall weather condition and this will minimize, I mean, kernels being weathered or issues with pre-harvest protein. Fertility, crop nutrient requirement and fertilizer application are influenced by several factors and understanding how these factors interact and their consequent impact on crop yields are important. Furthermore, getting your crop off to a good start is important. But also important is ensuring that the crop has access to the needed nutrients to complete its life cycle. For instance, for high quality oats production, I mean, test weight is king. I mean, you can have these, but you need to be having those test weight to be to be able to get good, good prices for your oat from green millers. And depending on where you farm, you will probably be putting anywhere between 55 to 100 pounds of nitrogen down per acre. And this is because, I mean, nitrogen is tied to moisture. So places that have higher amounts of moisture, like places in the Northeast, where I am, as opposed to places in the South Sea, probably Congress or Moose Jaw, that has lower moisture, those farmers will be a bit hesitant in pushing their, in pushing the amount of nitrogen that they put down with the crop. But if, if you're in an area that has high moisture, you have a variety that has good yield, yield potential, then you have the ability to be pushing your nitrogen rates. Next slide, please. So as I said, I mean, nitrogen is great for leading to yield increases, but it can have negative impact on your crop. For instance, for malt barley, too much nitrogen tends to increase the protein and maltsters generally don't want, I mean, barley that has very high levels of protein. And this is because they have found a relationship between as the amount of nitrogen that's applied is increased, then the protein content of the kernel also increased. And as I said before, I mean, too much nitrogen, or if, 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 if we are unable to find that nitrogen balance between our target yield for oats and our environmental condition and our varietal selection, then we run the risk of having a reduced test weight. But the, re the real challenge comes with higher nitrogen rates. So if you're considering pushing your nitrogen rates, 
you may have to look at issues like, I mean, what's the lodging potential? What's the protein content that my barley market or end user are, are willing to accept? And I mean, what is going to be that sweet spot between enough nitrogen and still maintaining a good test weight for 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 my oats? And the other macronutrients are also very important. And I must touch on potassium because we live in Saskatchewan and there are so many, I mean, potash reserves in the soil. We tend to forget or we tend to overlook an addition of potassium in our fertility package and planning. But this is very important, especially as a nutrient that can help to reduce the amount of lodging that your crop will have over time. Just because it's going to be the nutrients that's that's going to be helping with, I mean, developing soil wall integrity and water transportation throughout the plant. Diseases, um, they're going to happen. The extent and or severity is going to be dependent on a number of factors. It's going to be dependent on the variety you're growing, the environmental condition in any given year, if your crop had sufficient, I mean, fertility at the beginning so that it can fight off diseases and stuff like that. But we do have techniques that are very useful in helping to minimize or mitigate the risk of diseases, and that is fungicides. So while spraying, the timing of fungicide is always going to be an issue, you know. Do I go in at herbicide timing or do I wait for flag leaf or do I wait until head timing? And this again is going to be dependent on your crop. Like most oat growers will probably want to go in at herbicide time in order to wait until flag leaf. And that again is going to be dependent on the weather condition or the yield potential that they're seeing coming from that crop. If you're growing feed barley, you'd probably want to skip your fusarium timing and just going in with a fungicide for flag leaf that's going to be protecting the crop and helping green filling and stuff like that. If you're growing malt barley, you'll definitely be thinking of either going in at flag leaf and or head timing. But that again is going to be dependent on several factors. Next slide, please. So um, not going to go into too much detail about this slide here. So what Cargill has been doing for the past few years is running a program called a Build a Better Barley, and this is done in conjunction with Syngenta. And it, at our local teams, we encourage that you have a full fertility thing, but what the program basically targets is going to be making sure that you have that appropriate seed treatment on your on your on your seeds prior to planting. So getting your seeds tested, seeing what's there, putting on your seed treatment, doing your in crop herbicide using something from the Syngenta lineup, an axial branded product or something like that, and having a flag leaf product onto your barley. And if you want to find out further information about how the Build a Better Barley program works and what rebates you're likely to get and stuff like that, I highly recommend reaching out to your local Cargill representative and they'll be able to walk you through this program and you'll find that it's something that if it, it I mean, you don't have to try it on all your acres, but it can be a fit for some portion of your barley acres just because it offers you that incentive of getting an extra amount of rebates. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what's new for 2021? So every year we will probably hear about new products coming down. And yes, there are going to be some new pre-seeds and in-crop herbicides for both oat and barley. There's also going to be some new flag leaf and fusarium fungus fungicides as well. But what I'm going to talk about mostly is I'm going to talk about um, MODUS, which is a plant growth regulator. And if you are concerned about lodging, then plant growth regulators or PGRs, as we call them, may be an option for you. If you know you are growing a variety that is prone to lodging and your rates are high, I would definitely recommend using a PGR. But just keep in mind that PGRs don't eliminate lodging and the highly susceptible varieties may still lodge. 
What the PGR is likely to do is to delay the onset of lodging for those varieties that, that are prone to lodging. So Syngenta has launched their new product called Modus, and it will be available commercially for the 2021 season. It's recommended in wheat, feed, barley, and oats. And while the ideal application stage is growth stage 30 to 32, you may still ap apply it all the way up to growth stage 39. So this past summer, the MDA team at Cargill did a variety of trials with motors in collaboration with the Syngenta team. And the pictures on the right are taken from a field test that I did in Prince Albert, and it was on Claymore Barley. So if you are seeing the screen and you can see the picture, you'll see that to the left. You'll see that to the left. Um, to the left, you will see that there is some lodging, and this was taken at like 21 days after the product was applied. So you see some lodging right there. And to the right is the treated part that had motors applied. And you realize that there is minimum amount of lodging. If you look at the picture on the bottom, what you're going to realize is that this is the day that we were out harvesting, and you can actually see like a marked difference. So again, same same position. If you look to the left, you'll see the amount of large 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 plants, and you look to the to the right, and you see that the plants are still standing. So what we found that was happening, like when we went out at when we went out at 21 days post product application, we actually found that the plants that were treated with motors were a bit shorter than the plants that weren't treated. And this is because and this is because modus is, as I said, a plant growth inhibitor that uses gibralic acid. And what it does is shortens the distance between the stem internodes. There is also some amount of stem thickening as well. And this stem thickening is going to be useful in in, in, in helping the plant to resist to resist to resist lodging, right? Another thing that we found is that another thing that we found is that we had an increased yield over the untreated section, and the increase in yield that we got was significant, right? So. The yield difference was, oh, let me see. It was more than 20 bushels. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but it was significantly different. Also of importance to note is that this was th this modus was applied at growth stage 32, and growth stage 32 is just right there about, I mean, six leaves, just beginning a stem elongation. <clears throat> and the difference in yield can also be attributed to the fact that because you had so much such a high percentage of large plants it was just impossible for the grower to pick everything up and that would have resulted in an adverse effect on overall yield potential so i found that it worked and i mean syngenta's data that they have put out in regard to, to this trial has positive re results across the province from the other MDS, MDA team. So it's a very good product. And as I said, if you are into pushing high nitrogen rates, you're into wanting, you're into wanting, I mean, good yields, then it a plant growth regulator might be an option for you or is an option that you should consider doing. So I see that we're having lots of questions in the text box. So let me see. All right, so how much of a yield difference there was? Is one minute, Robert, and I'll answer that. Da -da -da. It was the yield difference was actually 36 bushel. That's what it was. And the variety was Claymore, Claymore barley, 
And what was the girl's thought? So, I mean, the girl was very pleased with, with the product and he liked how it worked. It was easy. It was easy to apply. And he's definitely going to be using it on his barley next year. He was excited from the get go, right? So seven days after the product was applied, he actually called me and he's like, hey, I drove, I drove by my barley field. And I actually think that that part that has your new product is looking way greener. So at 14 days after, because I was like super excited too, I went by and I realized that you were starting to see events of lodging and all of that. So, I mean, he, he was very pleased with how the product, with, with how the product worked, the standability of, 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 of the crop and everything. He was also pleased too with, I mean, harvesting, right? Because he felt he didn't want to put an exact time to it, but he felt that the part that were, that was large was just like way took, well, undoubtedly it took him way more longer to lodge than the, to, to combine, sorry, than the part that was standing. How much does Moda's cost per acre? I am not exactly sure of the cost of Moda's per acre, so I'm going to ask you to reach out to your local Cargill rep, I mean CI rep, or if that person is on the line and can contact Robert, they could probably tell him what it is that the cost per acre for Moda's is going to be. And 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 yes, Rob, it was Claymore and the yield difference was 26 bushel. And sorry, Mike, Modus can be tank mixed with other pesticides because in this trial we actually tank mixed it with Triver Pro and Syngenta is actually working on sending out their tank mix partner sheet for the product, but it should be able to be tank mixed with lots of commonly used pesticides that girls are going to be putting on. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me and I'll now hand you over to Gavin who will tell you all about marketing your oats and barley after you have grown a superb crop. Thanks, Lilith. Um, hi, I'm Gavin Andrews. I'll just maybe wait a few more seconds to see if there's any last questions regarding your slideshow there, Lilith. Assuming everybody can hear me. Yeah, you're all good, Gavin. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Gavin Andrews. I'm a grain marketing advisor out of our, our Clavet location. I work with a team of three with um, Chris Kuntz. Um, he's our senior executive advisor and Amy Hughes, which is our internal advisor. Um, I've been with Cargill for about th over 13 years. And I've been a grain marketing advisor um, almost coming up 10 years here in April. So just when you can say I've I've seen it all a uh, year like this happens. I did start in 2008 and experienced some of those prices um, say with canola, wheat, corn, that sort of thing as well. And kind of testing some of those highs as we speak here today. So we'll we'll cover off um, uh, the corn market, the, uh, the barley market, and we'll cover off oats here as well. But please feel free. Um, I'll, I'll kind of go over the the thirty thousand foot view, kind of what's driving things, where we see opportunities for next year, and um, yeah. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask them or put them in the chat, and we'll we'll, we'll take care of them here as well. So um, to start talking about barley and oats, um, basically we got to talk about corn. Corn is the main driver. Um, I like to call corn the king. So as um, I mean, this will set the trend for the feed grains, um, also pretty much all of our cereal crops here as well. So the market has been uh, really live here over the last, um, call it six months, since uh, July or in August. So I'll go over some of these numbers of what's maybe driving up these barley prices and the oat prices and and just kind of looking at that outlook and what, what do we do with these prices and will they last, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll dive into corn first. This is going to set the stage. So at the start, I know everybody can't see this, but I have the, the corn supply and demand um, showing here on the screen. And what it shows is that um, 
uh, the yields up at the tops. We had about 82 and a half million acres in the U.S. And uh, the big difference here was their yield. Um, they had a USDA report that came out on Tuesday of this week, and they had lowered the estimated yield down to 172 bushels per acre. So this was a pretty big drop. Um, the previous report in December had dropped it from 175, or had it at 175. And if I go all the way back, and I'll show you a, a price chart here in a second, but if we go back, the U.S. was anticipating a, a pretty big crop, just like we were in Canada as well. Um, we had really uh, a good start to the growing conditions, but then um, either the heat or some adverse weather in the U.S. took a toll on these crops as well. So very similar to what we had seen here in Canada. So at one time, the U.S. was thinking they were going to have 183 bushels per acre. That was the report in August. And you can see here now how it's at 172. So that's a pretty big drop considering we were considering a, a huge crop of corn um, and that number has dramatically changed. So along with that, um, we're seeing increased demand for feed grains coming out of China. So we've kind of got the, I don't know, the, the best of both worlds in a sense. We have increased demand from China and then we have poor crops right around the world when we look at the, the corn supply. So this is a recipe for higher prices. And um, just to give us an idea, the, the carryout with the corn back in that August USDA report, um, they were pegging it to be in the 2021 crop, 3.7 billion bushels was the estimated carryout for this upcoming year's crop. So now that we've digested the numbers, the harvest is in, uh, the US has now printed a number of 1.5 billion bushels. So we've basically lost 2.2 billion bushels of grain um, since August. So when you cut the number that dramatically, um, we do start to see uh, the prices of corn starting to ratchet up. And as the corn price ratchets up, um, that's going to push along barley and as well our oat crop as well. Um, so why is that demand increase from China? Um, a few years ago, they had uh, an African swine um, rip through their hog market or ha hogs. So they um, called a lot of hogs. Um, closed down a lot of barns, um, and they've been replenishing that hog or those hogs. So year over year, depending on what stage those hogs are at, um, there's anywhere from 30 to 50% more hogs in China um, year over year. So they're re revamping things. Um, they're in buying very aggressively, and that's kind of set the tone for these, these markets. So there isn't a lot of corn. There was a, a kind of a few wrecks in around the Black Sea, North America, so we're very tight on our corn supplies in, in, in the world. And you throw in um, uh, soybeans into that mix. So the lack of soybean meal, um, that's driven up those meal prices and has kind of set the stage for the oil seed complex as well, which we had learned about um, a few days ago um, through these meetings. So I'll, I'll, I'll go over the next slide here, um, which is the, the corn markets. So what I'm showing here now is the March corn uh, chart. Um, and what it shows us here is just what price action we've seen over the last year. So this is the March um, current futures off the March March corn. And um, if I allude back to, we're in an upward trending market. Um, going back um, when I was describing that that large report at the start of August, uh, the futures hit, a, hit the one year low when that report came through in August. So on August uh, 12th, I believe it was, the corn price was 3.31 a bushel, and um, on Wednesday we hit a new high. The, that high was um, 5.41 a bushel, and today the market is down about five cents throughout the day, and we're hovering at around 5.30. So today's price we're at 5.30 a bushel. The low back at the start of August was 3.31. So we've really rallied this corn market two dollars a bushel. Or since uh, since the beginning part of August, and even to to add to that um, rally, um, if I look at the December 28th um, price on December 28th, corn was 4.56 a bushel, and today we're at 5.30. So even over the last call it two weeks here, we've rallied corn roughly by about 75 cents um, just in the last I don't know call it two weeks. So that's been a pretty um, pretty significant rally. Um, I know I'm not supposed to talk about wheat, but I believe that's what's um, causing the wheat market to rally here as well. So again, as corn is the king, as that market starts to rally, um, it, it's pushing it a lot higher uh, going forward. So uh, flipping gears to the next chart. 
here on corn, what we're looking at is a, a 10 year chart on corn. Um, just to kind of widen out that perspective of what this rally means. So when corn rallies 75 cents over the next two or over the last two weeks, where does that put it on the long term chart? And um, I guess how much higher could this corn price end up? So we have hit the, the 2013 high um, that was roughly in around five and a quarter. Um, and as we hit that 540, we, we blew through there. So the next levels, um, when we look at the price, um, is back in that 2011, 2012. Um, we've seen a drop in 2013 with an increase of acres and some better crops coming through. Um, those prices um, between 2011 to 2013 for corn were in that 550 uh, to roughly even almost $8 a bushel. So again, um, we went through a pretty severe uh, drought in 2012 that had rallied the markets. And um, I mean, can we get to those levels? I guess it's yet to be determined. Um, I think it would take uh, more news uh, to come through this. Um, we did we did cut that um, yield again on here in December. So I would say there's probably more yield cuts that would have to be made or increased demand um, going further as well. Or as we get into new crop um, outlooks, I'm um, just looking at South America as their crop will start to come off um, here in March and April for their corn crop. So that's really the next um, next uh, weather or the next uh, production markets that we're looking at here as well, Argentina and South America. Um, so far at this point. So that sets the stage um, for corn um, going forward here. Um, essentially what we're looking at is that, yeah, there's there's still more room for corn to rally, but at the same time we need to, to continue to, to feed that, um, that, that bullish news or we need to continue to, to cut or to see that um, increased demand or that demand holding from China going forward here as well. Um, so before I slide into barley, I'll just ask if there's any questions uh, around corn at the moment. Yeah, Gavin, it's just hands here. Um, sure. Did you say production was cut 2.2 or uh, yeah, the, the cuts in the USDA report was 2.2 billion bushels? Yeah, so back in uh, August, um, when the USDA report came in August, um, they were anticipating um, like less demand coming out of China and then that big crop as well. So I don't know if Janine, if you can go back to that supply and demand chart, we'll just go back two slides. Yeah, so at the very bottom, we're showing a 1.5 billion bushel carryout, roughly about 11%. And at one point it was 3.7. So you're correct, Hans, it was 2.2 billion bushels um, higher back in August. So that's a significant um, difference. Um, is that like, forward. you know, is my math right on that? Like that's like 60 million tons? Um, it would be up. Yep. So again, the cut in yield. Um, so if you take 82 and a half million acres and shave off roughly, I guess, nine bushels to the acre. Um, I mean, there's there's a pretty big dent in that supply right there. And then also, too, I didn't go over the export line. Um, that's uh, close to the very bottom, just above the total use. Um, so the exports um, last year coming out of the U.S., again, when China wasn't really buying a lot of product just with uh, the coronavirus, I'm taking a toll on supplies and uh, demand. Um, last year, the U.S. exported 1.7 billion bushels of corn. Uh, this year, they're expected to export 2.5 billion bushels of corn. So even right there, um, just with that increased demand from China, we're seeing an extra, um, I mean, uh, 900 million um, bushels of, of, of an increased demand there as well. So if you shave off that, that yield drop or that production drop, um, add in that increased demand, and it's a recipe for for a very tight carryout going forward. So hopefully that answers your question, Hans. But yeah, that's yeah. you can kind of combine. There is a story behind it. You can kind of combine the the smaller crop, um, the increased demand, and then also the demand in the U.S. as well um, is is about flat uh, going forward. I was just so if everybody remembers just there's that, that big Gavin. wicked um, kind of hurricane type of storm that ripped through Iowa, Idaho. Um, kind of in the mid Midwest. Um, and the rumor was there that it affected between soybean and corn acres, there was about 14 million acres um, dramatically affected by that uh, big windstorm, basically shearing off corn. Um, I don't think that the damage was as bad on soybeans, but there was significant damage on that corn crop. And that said, had, had sucked down the yields with that. But uh, great question on that. And so that uh, opens the door for for a kind of an acreage battle. 
Um, I think we're all familiar with uh, the oil seed complex right now and the demand from China on soybeans and in particular with corn or canola as well. So what does that U.S. Uh, farmer grow? Um, soybeans over $14 a bushel on old crop and corn over $5 a bushel on old crop corn. I mean, markets are inverted when you look at the U.S. numbers, but um, I mean, we do need corn, we do need soybeans in the ground. So that'll, that'll be the, the big news story. I think going into this spring as well is is what are those seeding intentions and that i mean does spill into canada as well as as our i mean as we talk about barley here next i mean what do you grow as a farmer do you grow barley do you grow wheat do you grow oats and i think there's a lot of decisions um, being made right now on that cereal acre here in canada so i'll flip gears yeah to the barley s d thanks janina for that so as we go over the barley s d it's um um, kind of a, an interesting slide here. Um, I'll describe the acres at the top. So going back to um, I mean four years ago, back in 2017-2018, um, we had 5.7 million acres. Uh, then the following year we had 6.5 and then last year we had 7.4 and then in 2021, the old crop, we had 7.5 million acres. So over the last four years, um, we've been increasing our acres um, as, as much as almost 2 million acres going forward. So the idea for new crop uh, barley is that we would anticipate a, another increase to those acres. How much higher does it go? I think that'll be determined by these prices and, and maybe my presentation and Lilith's presentation as well. Um, yeah, so then if we go over the yields, um, we had about a 71.1 crop that was above the five-year average. So you combine a, you mean a, a high acre amount, 7.5 million with a, I mean, our second highest crop in the last five years, and we had a pretty big production year. We were over 10.7 um, million tons, so that was pretty significant. Last year, we had 10.3, um, and uh, that was was basically one of our I mean, the highest production years that we've ever had. I think we might have been one or two, basically looking at it that way. So as we break down the demand, um, there's been really strong demand um, from China. Um, in particular on our feed grains here as well. So as that uh, corn price starts to ratchet up, our feed and domestic use is about flat or it's just a hair under what we had seen last year. So we're at about 6.3 million tons. And then the food and other, which would include the malt, um, over the last five years, we've seen 1.1, 1, 1 million, 1 1.3, and last or two years ago at 1.2, this year at 1.3. So there, the malt demand is lower than previous years. Um, and we probably know the reasons behind that. I mean, lack of sporting events, um, bars, um, the social life is just isn't there right now, just with the virus. Um, so overall demand is down on malt, but um, but there is malt demand out there as well. It's maybe somewhat limited, maybe 10, 15%, but I mean, there's still great opportunities here as well. Now I'll get into malt here in a little bit more details. When we look at the exports, um, this would include uh, malt and feed grains that are being exported. So this includes anything that's basically leaving our country. Um, that's a big number there, if everybody can see that, at 3.1 um, million tons of barley will be exported this year. Our previous high was last year at 2.3 million tons, and that had surpassed the 2.3 from the year before, just a hair underneath that. So right as of right now, we're expected to export a record amount of barley and talking with our our market analysts um, they actually anticipate that that number even going higher than the 3.1 so this is based off of our um, our estimates right now but we do think it it, it could go higher so with that 3.1 million ton export um, that brings down our carryouts to about a million tons where over the last three years we had about 860 um, thousand tons, um, 957, and this year it, it does appear that we'll be over a million. But again, if demand continues to hold um, coming in from China, I think that we would slide that less than one million. Um, so a lot of the chatter is is around China. Um, will they continue to buy? And if we go over to the next slide here, I'll, I'll show you the the exports that are moving through. So year over year, we can see how dramatically the, the export pace has picked up. Um, and if we pretty much have to go back to 2014, 2015, when we started to see China really in, in increasing their, their buying capacity for Canadian barley, and it's really ramped up over the last couple of years. So 
good or bad um, when it comes to China. Um, you mean, I've heard from a lot of my, my growers that I, I work with on the Market Sense program. I mean, we kind of curse and swear about what China does, but when China's in buying, I mean, this is where our markets are at. So last year I described our, our exports were going to be about 2.3, or last year they were 2.3 million tons. Um, this year, China's expected to buy 2.3 million tons. So our total export program on barley last year is what China's buying this year. So you throw in other countries as well. Um, China has set the tone for the feed markets in the world. And because of that has, I mean, has caused other end users or other countries to step up and, and buy at these high prices as well. Um, what's, what's put Canadian barley in the driver's seat with, with Canada? Um, right now, China and Australia are, are in a trade war right now. Um, China has um, thrown on some, some trade taxes or some tariffs on some, some of the imports coming in from Australia. One of those is uh, barley. Um, so right now, I believe it's like 80% or 80.6%. 80, 80 um, any barley that's entering into China would get slapped on with uh, an 80% tax basically coming through. So similar to our canola story in Canada a few years ago when China said no to our canola, right now China's saying no to Australian barley and uh, that puts Canada in the driver's seat. So as long as they're disputing or, or having their differences, um, I mean, that puts Canada, Canadian barley in the spotlight uh, moving forward. So there's um, really strong demand right now coming through for China. Um, China has been very aggressive in this market, buying our old crop supplies. And um, at the moment, they are in the market for new crop purchases as well. So, so most locations um, through Cargill um, have feed barley opportunities. Um, it could be off the combine in September or we could be alluding to um, our o October, November, December opportunities. So as of right now, we're in that $5 range. Um, I feel like for most elevators in Saskatchewan. And um, last year, we were looking at malting opportunities in that same $5-ish range, maybe even 475 to five and a quarter. So China is in buying already for new crop. Um, that's a very positive sign. Um, one is that, well, what do they know that we don't in a, in a scenario like that? Are they buying to step back out of the market? Or are they buying product that they know they're gonna continue to need? And does that even push that, that market price even higher? So with, uh, again, with corn rallying the way it has the last um, a couple of weeks, it has pushed barley um, into sort of the next level-ish um, prices for old crop and new crop. And that's been putting a lot of questions into that marketplace about what do I grow next year? Do I grow a feed barley? Do I grow a malting barley? Um, we just heard that presentation from Lilith and it was, hey, how can we get, I mean, by spraying, say, a manipulator on a, or a plant regulator on a feed barley, can we get that extra, maybe 10, 20 bushels um, extra yield? And if prices are $5 a bushel for a feed barley next year, um, that, that ease of growing it where we can spray it out, um, spray it with regulator, kind of have more control over that barley. Um, I mean, even at a 80 bushels or 100 bushels, timesing that by five, um, I mean, that's a pretty good return when we look at a feed barley. So when we compare that to a malt barley, um, the concern is that there will be a lot of, lot of acres in the ground. And um, Janine, I'll get you to uh, slide through to the first choice um, slide, if you could, for barley. So our exports here, I'm just flying off the shelf, and then our next slide's on the, the first choice program. So we are anticipating um, an increase of acres. Um, and I think that there's a great chance right now to be growing a, a feed barley as those returns are, are showing quite profitable. Um, but when we look at malt barley, we haven't really seen the, the full extent of that malt offer for new crop yet. So I described that we have China in the market um, buying a lot of our, our feed grains right now, but they're, they haven't really shown their cards yet for, for malt barley. So um, I'm anticipating a, a big increase on, on barley acres. Um, that's the conversation that I'm having with my growers. Um, do we maybe look at increasing our acres? And um, if we're increasing that, are we chasing the malt market or are we chasing the feed market? So, so that decision sort of has to get made almost early or at least have that game plan of an attack, especially if you are considering um, uh, spraying different chemicals on that product. Um, generally with... Um, uh, with uh, 
with malting barley, we can spray a crop manipulator on that or glyphosate on that crop as, as well. It, it will really limit our, our malt access. And if I can describe the malt market, if you don't spray it with glyphosate, you have 100% access to that malt market. If you spray it with glyphosate, you've probably got 5% of that malt market uh, going forward. So it's mainly designing that plan today of, okay, if conditions are right, am I going after the malt market? And um, if my crop does, does start to slide um, or isn't looking as, as rosy as I first thought, maybe I will treat it as a feed and considering maybe having a feed hedge on the books to ensure some, some cash flow or some, uh, some movement in the fall, knowing if, if the barley crop isn't looking as strong, you do have that, that feed option or that feed price to fall back on. And if, hey, if all the barley makes it, it's great quality. Um, can we, um, I mean, just sell it into that feed market and then store or, or hold the rest for that malt market then. Um, I'll get to the questions here in one second. I'll, I just wanted to cover off our first choice program. So uh, on the Cargill malt program, we should be rolling out our first choice malt barley production contracts over the next uh, week or two. Um, you mean growers might have used this contract in the past. Um, it may or may not have worked for your farm, but um, I look at having it as I want to make sure that I have my toes or our, our feet in, with every market that we can. So by signing up a first choice small barley contract with Cargill, if acres are big and we do get a, a high quality or a, a high supply year in a limited, say, barley or a, a malt market, I want to make sure that uh, the growers that I work with have access to, 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 to every kind of source of, of a malt barley price. So by signing a first choice malt production contract with you, um, with Cargill. Um, it allows yourself, the grower, a competitive market, and it does give Cargill the first and last right of refusal. Um, Cargill is committed, though, to buy 1.25 metric tons, or roughly about 59, 60 bushels of your crop, uh, provided it, heats the, or it meets the minimum specs. So again, if there is a, a saturated or a flooded market, um, Cargill will provide you a, a market uh, as well. So by, by offering, you, offering them your acres on a first choice, um, you have that um, have that opportunity, um, and as well as by signing the first choice program, if Cargill has any um, uh, pre-harvest um, prices, um, you are able to access those as well. So just, I mean, I'm not sure where prices will be coming in at with Cargill, um, but if if the price is right and you do like it, it does give you access to to look at forward contracting as well. If you're not on the forward um, or on the first choice program. You do not have access to the Cargill's uh, marketing opportunities um, until that barley is, is submitted um, in the fall and, and maybe is selected through Cargill. Um, yeah, so that's what my big push is as well, just to make sure that we, we do have perhaps a production contract with Cargill if you're thinking about um, dealing with Cargill for malt um, going forward. And then um, I was going to speak on the variety access, um, but uh, there will be more information coming through. Again, as Cargill rolls out their first choice program, uh, that will have um, the varieties and just the demands and, and their outlook for these new, new varieties coming through. Um, at the moment, it still will be Copeland, Metcalf, and I believe Synergy will be on that first choice program. Uh, newer varieties like a, a Bow or a Connect, um, I think those are, are still in the works and more information to come uh, through those. Um, I don't have the graph, uh, Leonard, um, showing the difference um, between growth relate or manipulator and um, and without. Um, I guess with Lilith's uh, presentation, I believe she said it was over 20 bushels. Um, and again, it's more or less talking uh, maybe with the Syngenta reps, um, with your uh, reps through Cargill, because um, I know Lilith had a presentation on that with her trial, but um, there may be other growers that have grown it or other sales reps that have had some experience on that as well. Um, Robert, is $5 uh, December 21 a good price for some feed barley? Um, you mean, depending on the grower and depending on your needs, I'll give you that cliche answer. But um, I mean, depending on what you're anticipating for returns um, per yield, but at $5 even times 100, if we're looking at uh, feed barley at 100, um, that's $500 um, as a return. So, I mean, as we compare that to other crops like wheat or oats or canola, peas, that's really what we got to look at is um, long term rotations. If you're pushing things today, what would be the impact um, next year? But at the same time, does it fit the needs of the farm? And yeah, I do think $5 feed is a is a pretty good starting price. 
Um, I mean, can those prices go higher? I think it's really dependent on our growing season. If you can tell me if the pastures are going to be hot and dry and, and, and cooked um, come uh, June, July, then I feel like uh, the prices will go higher. If we have good, really good growing conditions, I anticipate barley acres being increased. So now it really comes down to the size of that corn crop. Um, what is the U.S. growing? And I, I feel like that demand from China will, will continue to last. So um, didn't give you the straight up answer, Robert, but um, I guess an idea is that at $5 is a very good starting price. Um, I know it is for a few of my growers that I work with. And then again, it's just looking at that hedge. Do you hedge in some feed barley? Or if you are a malt grower, um, considering where those malt prices might be. So unless it's kind of waiting for the next week or two, understanding where that malt price is coming in at, and then having your farm decide, is that premium enough um, for me to be throwing in malt barley? Or do I hedge something with the, the feed price, knowing again, if your quality isn't quite there, you have that price to fall back on uh, at harvest time or in the fall time as well. Um, so that's, um, and then regarding old crop, um, most of the, or yeah, one comment I guess on the old crop was uh, most of the malt demand has been pushed into the, into the summer windows. So I know a lot of the, the questions have been, well, how come the feed price is higher than the malt price? Well, again, it's, it comes down to the demand. Um, most of the demand for malt was um, kind of gobbled up uh, back in December, January for these spring needs. Um, and, and end users have filled um, their positions um, essentially. So now that the feed market is, is hot, um, demand is sort of in the nearby months as, as China is aggressively buying it. We have seen feed prices um, uh, outpace the malt prices here in the short term. Um, but again, malt has been showing a slight premium in the further out windows, but the, the feed market's been, been very hot right now as well. Um, I don't believe so, Leonard. Uh, the question was, can I get a malt price uh, for barley that had manipulator on it? Um, I don't believe um, any, or I, I, I mean, news is always changing, so I'd always double check um, before, but um, I, I believe the answer right now is, is no. If your malt barley has been sprayed with um, a manipulator, it, um, it cannot be selected for malt, I believe. A lot of end users um, will not accept it if it's been sprayed with manipulator, and I believe that's still the, the current state. Very similar to, to glyphosate. Um, I mean, you can spray it, but it pretty much limits you, your, your marketing opportunities. And I believe the first choice program, when it gets rolled out, will state that uh, more than likely you can spray it with manipulator. And um, yeah, if there's any updates on that, um, I mean, we can provide those, but I, I believe it'll be the status quo from last year. And again, I'm just basing off of it uh, from last year's data as well. Um, any other questions on barley? I, I might be going a little bit over time, but um, oats isn't uh, as a heavy lifting topic, but um, I'll, I'll slide into oats here and if there's any further questions we can uh, continue along here as well. Um, looking at oats, um, we have been increasing our acres here as well since 2018-2019. Uh, uh, we had 3 million acres that year, uh, two years ago 3.5 and and 3.8 million last year. So that was a pretty big increase um, as, as growers maybe responded to those old prices. Um, so last year we had about a, a 95 bushel crop. Um, with that increase of acres, we did have uh, pretty much a, almost a record amount of production, 4.5 million tons. Um, uh, overall though, um, demand is about flat from last year. Um, we're using about the same amount here in Canada. Um, what we're exporting for, for grain and for, for food um, is about flat as well. So really no big question marks around the demand on oats. Um, and our ending stocks have been increasing just as our acres have been increasing as well. Um, in that oat market though, you might see that um, prices for the most part have, have hung on. Even though we have uh, a higher carryout, we've almost doubled it or, or added about a third of that carryout from, from our three year ago crop. Um, but what we're seeing though is again, corn prices have been rallying. So that's going to be following along with that corn price. So as corn is hitting, I mean, seven, eight year highs, well, it is going to help um, push along that, that oat price here as well. Um, so we are seeing some pretty strong values with oats um, as we move forward. So that's the, the supply and demand on oats, just a, a quick uh, hitter on the supply and demand. But we're, we're, we're looking at about 600,000 tons of a carryout. Um, that's right kind of smack dab in the five year average. And next year we're anticipating acres 
to potentially be about flat to maybe slightly down as we're coming off that pretty much a record high of acres then. And I, I believe acres could get swung into wheat and into um, canola and barley as well. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll flip over to my last slide on oats. Sorry, I'm going a little bit over time here, but really the oat market has developed into a tier two tier marketing or a two tier market. Um, and it really comes down to glyphosate free oats and glyphosate sprayed oats. And that's the, the really the two tiers of the market. Um, I'll get to that question in one second. Um, yeah, I don't believe malt story, just going back to the question was, do maltsters accept or will maltster or maltsters do not accept um, barley treated with um, um, manipulators? And that's correct. Um, I don't feel like the end users will accept it again if it's sprayed with glyphosate or sprayed with a regulator um, because it's going into that um, the food market. Um, a lot of tight con controls over what's on that food and and a lot of um, more regulate regulations or restrictions on those products as well. Um, so going back to the oat market, um, we have a two tiered market and um, the market is um, evolving into a, a glyphosate free and a glyphosate sprayed oat. Um, so about four years ago, five, four or five years ago, Richardson or sorry, General Mills or sorry, uh, Grain Millers um, was the first end user to, to flip over and um, looking at a, a, a glyphosate free oats. So they kind of set the tone about four or five years ago um, going forward um, in their uh, plants in Yorkton and then in Manitoba as well. So they've started to source oats and I do believe they buy both oats um, going forward as well. And then as um, as the years have evolved, um, we've seen Richardson can oat um, this year move into a, a glyphosate free oat as well. Um, so Richardson can oat would be sort of the number one um, end user in North America. Um, grain millers being number four and Quaker and General Mills in, in between there at number two and three. So end users do still buy um, glyphosate uh, sprayed oats. Um, those end users would be Quaker and General Mills. So Cargill's capacity, um, as you get further east um, into our eastern corridors or even into Manitoba, our market capacity does open up. So you might say, well, how come my elevator in central Saskatchewan doesn't have an oat bid? Well, it's generally where the oat acres are grown. So the tendency are is, is that oat acres um, get increased, say, to the north or to the east um, and then to the northwest. Um, that's where mainly where our, 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 um, our market capacity is. So as we get into Manitoba, our programs for oats are, are quite strong. And as we look into Saskatchewan here, we're more of an, an export play. So we would have um, opportunities out of Belcaris, North Battleford, and um, speaking with our merchant, um, over the last couple of years, Cargill has opened up um, some doors into the South American oat market. Um, so uh, recently, Cargill has been making some strides um, through the West Coast, through the ports there, and then all the way down to South America, into Chile, uh, Uruguay, um, different countries down in South America. And have actually opened up a, an exporting program, which, which feels like should be ramping up this year as well. So no, we may not have oat opportunities all the time, like a, a posted bid, but um, when Cargill recognizes, hey, we can make a sale, go in and source some oats, um, we will have those opportunities perhaps out of North Battleford, Valcaris, and then again, as we get further east into to Manitoba is where our oat, for, oat program is a little bit stronger then. Yeah. So, so again, as we look at oats, um, I mean, can yield pretty well as well, um, I mean, depending on what we're seeing here. But um, really what we got to think about in Talila's presentation as well, when you go to start to plan this crop, how are you treating this crop? And um, if you do spray your oat crop out with, with glyphosate, which, which is you mean a, a challenge when you're growing 150, 200 bushel oats, um, how, do you, how do you get that harvest through? How do you maintain that uh, milling quality? So um, our merchant described it this way is when you do spray out your oats, um, we basically give up about half of the, the oat market. So similar to glyphosate on malt barley, when you spray it out, you've gone from about 100% market access to about 5%. And with oats, um, end users do buy it sprayed, but again, from what you can see here, about half the end users purchase it when it's sprayed out. Uh, the export market can be sprayed, so you always have access to that, but um, that's really what we're looking at here now with oats is um, how, how, how will it evolve um, going forward? And as of right now, going into next year, um, this is where those end users stand. And um, so we, I mean, we're going to go through another year with both having sprayed and non-sprayed markets uh, moving forward then. 
I, I do feel like we're probably drifting towards that, if, um, if you were to ask my opinion. Um, just like um, how the world's looking for more sustainable acres or more sustainable um, food or, or products, I feel like eventually we will continue to slide there. But um, will the market support it? And right now we are looking at a, a two-tiered market. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to cover off on on oats and on on barley and corn, just to kind of set the set the stage, I guess, from what we're seeing uh, through Cargill or, or through our market sense program, um, through those uh, three commodities as well. I guess does anybody have any further questions? I've just tried to answer them through the the comments there, but um, feel free to ask uh, Lilith or I any uh, any further questions. Uh, so the question came through: What are the milling prices for uh, milling prices and in, in feed oats as well? Um, I haven't been following the the feed market as close. Um, again, depending on uh, which end users that you're looking at and if you've sprayed out your oats or not. But um, I mean, describing it, there are offers over four dollars um, for that non-sprayed oat and a, a sprayed oat as well. Um, I feel like there's m most end users. I think do have some capacity in the the spring windows here. And then as you get a little bit deeper into the summer, uh, uh, prices have um, appreciated as well. Um, going into new crop, they are a little bit lower. If we're kind of pushing towards that 375 to, to maybe four and a quarter, say in around that Saskatoon area, um, prices for new crop are a little bit lower, sort of in that three to 350-ish ranges as well. But um, are, are seeing some, some pretty good offers um, I mean, to get started with. But again, when you're comparing it to wheat or to, um, Barley, I mean, where does that, that, that pencil in, I guess, to uh, moving forward as well? And what are, and then the question is, what are we expecting for prices next fall for oats? Um, I think that it really comes down to um, where those acres come in at. Um, I, I feel like we have a, an okay supply of oats at 600,000 tons. Um, we've been increasing that. So I don't think it's really a push that, well, we're going to run out of oats. I feel like there will be a, maybe an increase increase on the old price just to secure some um, last minute acres. Um, but overall, it's really going to be dependent on that corn price. If uh, corn is over $5 a bushel, well, I think it allows uh, that, that oat price and the barley price to remain fairly firm and supportive, if not maybe creeping higher. Um, but again, if corn starts to fall or we're, I mean, we're, 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 if, if the corn price is falling, you know, I would expect to see that barley and the oat price to, to sag a little bit as well. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gavin and Lilith, for everything you've presented today. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap things up here um, as we are about 10 after 10. Um, but want to thank everybody, um, growers and um, and our presenters over the last week for all the information that we were able to share with you. And uh, if you have any questions, be sure to reach out to your um, appropriate Cargill uh, either grain marketing advisor or um, grain rep or crop input rep, any of your um, Cargill reps will be happy to help you with any questions you might have um, on anything that was presented this week. And uh, definitely looking forward to hearing some feedback on what you thought of the whole week that we tried to put together here for you. It's been a great week from my perspective, and I'm hoping all of our growers enjoyed it as well. One more thing, Stacy. Um, I believe for those um, the Visa gift cards, um, oh. I believe we'll be doing that um, uh, the draws uh, early next week. So if there are some lucky winners, um, we'll be announcing that early next week if, if you had one or not. Awesome. Thank you for that, Gavin. Have a great weekend, everybody.